Hello again my fellow nerds and geeks. In this video I'm going to be talking a little bit about this stack of PCBs, what they are and how they work. This video will also cover the soldering process with some up close videos of solder melting and even some more clips of it working. Let's get right into it. These PCBs were once again sponsored by PCBWay. When PCBWay first reached out to me to sponsor my PCBs, I was very excited because I was already using them to get all my PCBs made. I wanted to design them a board as a way to say thanks, and I also needed to make a prototype for the circuit stack idea that I had. I was able to do both with this set of PCBs. In this order, I had five different PCBs. I also got my first stencil, more on that later. The circuit stack illuminator prototype consists of a total of four different PCBs, which I call layers. Layer 1, or L1, is the base PCB that has all the components soldered to it. L2 attaches to L1 with pad to vias, which I have demonstrated it in another video. L2 has cutouts for all the parts on layer 1, so they can fit snugly together. L3 attaches to L4, also with pads to via. It only has a cutout in it for the PCBWay logo. L4 is the top layer. It has a cutout in the solder mask and copper layer in the shape of the PCBWay logo in order to let the light from the LEDs shine through. Here is an example of what they will look like when they are all stacked together. The two soldered halves will be held together with neodymium magnets held in place with epoxy. I also got L4 made in black just to see if one looked better than the other. Which do you think looks better? The dimensions of each board is 40 by 100 millimeter and are the standard 1.6 millimeter thickness. They all turned out great. This is the first PCB that I have made that I also ordered a stencil with. To use a stencil, I first made an arrangement of PCBs around it to hold it in place. And then taped it down. The stencil came shipped in some very rich material so it was well protected. The stencil is essentially just a thin sheet of steel with some holes cut out of it. The holes correspond to the paste layer as defined by your PCB. I didn't have any alignment marks, so I had to line it by hand, which wasn't too bad. Once I was happy with the alignment, I taped the stencil down into place as well. I then applied some solder paste to the stencil and spread it around. I don't have a tool specifically for this, so I just used the lid of a CPU that I happen to have lying around. I put a piece of Kapton tape over one edge and it seemed to work out pretty well. This paste is more than five years old and I have had to revive it a few times with some liquid flux. Because of this, it isn't an ideal consistency anymore, but it still seemed to work okay. Ta-da! Oh, you. Well, it mostly worked okay. I think this method would have worked better if I had fresh paste, and also if I did it on a harder surface. Now it's time to place the parts. I started with the big QFN parts, and then I placed all the smaller SMD components next. These first two parts are the LED drivers. Each one is capable of driving up to 36 LEDs by itself. They both talk to this part, the AT Mega. 328 PB over I2C communication, which is routed up to layer 2 to get over all the LED traces. This last chip is the CP2102N USB to UART adapter, which I used to upload Arduino sketches to the ATA Mega chip. I then started with the LEDs. I had a printout of the schematic that I referenced for the polarity since the silkscreen markings were all covered up. There are 36 LEDs for the letters and 13 for the slash, so 49 LEDs total. Don't blink! 
there was just a few more parts that I had to place, like resistors and capacitors, and some miscellaneous LEDs. And the micro USB connector too. With everyone in place, it's time to reflow the solder. I don't have a reflow oven, so I do all of my soldering by hand with a hot air rework station. The air on my station can go all the way up to 480C, but for this I kept it to around 320C. I start high and far away from the PCB and slowly move towards it in circular motions. I'm trying to avoid creating hot spots, and if I heat up the paste too quickly, parts can pop off from the flux evaporating all at once. When I see the parts start to reflow, I will keep the heat on them until I see the solder melt, and then I'll move on to the next part. What I'm really looking for is the molten solder's surface tension to bring the part into alignment. Then I can have a high confidence that not only is the part aligned well, but the ground pad underneath is melted too. The LEDs are much simpler to solder, as they only have two terminals. If a part doesn't go into alignment like this part, I'll quickly try to nudge it back into place while the solder is still molten. If I'm lucky, I can get it into place like this, otherwise I'll let it cool down and come back to it if I've been heating it for too long. After reflow, I'll check every pin of every part to make sure that they aren't shorted together. In the case of these parts, there are a lot of shorts due to the excessive amount of paste on them and they aren't centered very well either. To fix this, I apply some tacky rosin flux to each part and then reheat them with the hot air. The rosin flux stays around longer than the, the no-clean liquid flux and helps to create solid bonds. When the solder is molten, I just touch the parts with a tweezer until they snap into place. With all of the parts soldered, the next step is to solder L2 onto L1 using the pad to vias. I clamp the boards together using some binder clips to keep them aligned. I accidentally deleted the original video of this, so please excuse this footage of the process without any parts placed on these boards. The process is simple. Stick the iron in the hole and fill it with solder. I like to swirl the iron around and make sure that it is touching the pad on L1 to make sure that I have a good connection. I use the same process for the small holes too. I just use a different tip on my iron. With a fine tip, I am able to get the tip of the iron to touch the pad on the board underneath it. I actually like to make two passes here, one to first fill the via with solder and the second where I shove the tip all the way in and touch the bottom pad. This makes sure that they are very well bonded. With everything soldered together, it's time to power it on. This prototype takes the 5 volts from a micro USB connector. After the AT Mega is programmed, applying power turns everything on, and the AT Mega starts to run code in its loop, which in this case is just a loop through a set of animations that I've coded. It waits for 10 seconds in between each animation, keeping the LEDs on while it waits. It looks great with the cover off, but I think it looks even better with it on. One reason that this works, and why the light also spills out the sides, is because of the material that PCBs are made out of. These PCBs specifically are FR4 material, 
which is layers of woven fiberglass cloth sandwiched together with epoxy. The light travels through the fiberglass, much like how it does in fiber optic lights. And now, here's some bonus content. Here's the board operating as viewed from a thermal camera. Thanks for watching the video. If you have any questions about this design, please let me know in the comments below. I can't wait to finish the main reason why I developed this prototype. If you want to see that or more, please subscribe here or follow me on Instagram. See you next time.